Start with Revelation 1, 4 through 7. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace from to you who, from him who is and was and is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and Je from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of kings of the earth, to him who loves us has, has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming from the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the people on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Revelations 5, 6 through 10. Then I saw a lamb, looking as it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, because you were slain, and with the blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and every language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Revelations 20, 4 through 6. I saw, the, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. And they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So be it. Let me start by saying, I won't be as long today. How's that? <laughs> but I thought it was pretty good that I got word for, well, not word for word, went by verse by verse and did four chapters of Hebrews. My goal was to try to get all the way through Hebrews in three weeks, but it is not going to happen. Okay? <laughs> You're going to see us go through chapters 5, 6, and 7 today, but I want to take you through that verse by verse so that you can see what the author of Hebrews is trying to tell us about what we just read there, Mark just read for us, about our glorious future. Come on, guys. We should always be full of joy because of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So let's start with prayer and then we'll dig in. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for you are a mighty, awesome God, that you, your ways are so much further than ours, that you love us so much, that you've planned all these wonderful things for those that love you since the beginning of time, even though you knew that we would be a stiff-necked, rebellious people that would sin against you and not want your dominion in our lives. And without you, as the psalm we read this morning, if we read it, we wouldn't even exist, we wouldn't even breathe. Every day that we get out of bed, it is a blessing from you, O oh God, that we even exist. And we thank you for that. Open our ears, open our eyes to see Jesus and to live a life that brings glory and honor to him until we see our faith become sight and we reign as a kingdom of priests with Jesus. Help us to reign as the kingdom of priests that you've called us to do today in this world so that we can show others the way to Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. If you didn't notice from those verses that Mark read, 
Three times the word priest is used in Revelation, and each time it is used is in the passages that he read to us today. And also it implies the word is kingdom is there or the word reign is there. We will reign, we do reign with King Jesus, and we are priests with Jesus. And that's what we're going to look at today in um, the book of Hebrews. You start reading the book of James this week. I'm not going to be preaching on James. But I want to talk to it about just a little bit first. James, if the author of Hebrew refers to Psalms a lot, you're going to notice a uh, re reference to the Proverbs a lot in the book of James. You're also going to recognize, if you're reading and paying attention, that there's quite a lot from the Sermon on the Mount that G James talks about. James is also talking to Hebrews, to Jews who have the background of the Old Testament. And sometimes we fail in that so we don't understand it quite as well. That's why I want to go verse by verse through it. And James is telling the early church, the ones that are Hebrews, he's telling them that they might say that their faith is genuine, but he says if your faith is not a living faith, if it's not put into action, you better step back and look at your faith again because it might not be faith at all at least saving faith, okay? So as you read that, understand that James is writing to these people that have been uh, saturated with God and the Old Testament and everything, but they think they're still okay in just their position. <laughs> they're not living a life that brings glory and honor to God. Now as you think about that, think about a priesthood. Jesus never referred to himself as a priest either. But he constantly referred to himself as a sacrifice, that he was going to suffer and die. Jesus is our priest, our high priest, and our sacrifice. No man could do that. And a man who did go into the Holy of Holies once a year offered up an animal as a copy or an image. It could never cleanse us from our unrighteousness. And unless that happens, unless you realize that, that you have a sin debt to God, that you are, cannot be in God's presence or anything else, then you can't come to the concept of what Jesus Christ has done for you. You would not exist if God did not breathe life into you. You would not function anything else, and you certainly wouldn't spend an eternity with God except that Jesus Christ, the God-man, became Flesh and blood, he was a priest that laid down his life as a sacrifice for your sins. Wow, what an incredible story. A priest also offers prayers and petitions to God for the people. He cleanses himself as well as laying down the offerings and the gift sacrifices for the people. Jesus did not have to lay down any offerings for himself because he was sinless. So therefore he could become that offering. And think about that as we approach Easter and everything. God was fully human. Uh, Jesus was fully human. He had to go through all the emotional turmoil of the sins of you and I and pleading for them. Plus, He physically, had the, physically and spiritually had the sins of all mankind placed on Him. He was the offering before God. Wow. Hebrews chapter 4 is where we left off. Starting in verse 14, and I will go through the verses so you can turn there if you want to turn there. There will be a few times I depart from Hebrews, but you'll be able to follow along. In verse 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest, we already determined that, who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we pr profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empath empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. So then, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Again, that may not mean as much to you, but to the Hebrews, to the Israelites, that was preposterous. That was blasphemy. People didn't enter into God's presence. We've got plenty of stories from the Old Testament. If they went into God's presence whatsoever or didn't do His commandments as He told them specifically, they might just be consumed by fire, right? 
But the author of Hebrews is saying here, since we have this high priest who is Jesus Christ, who is greater than angels, greater than Moses, greater than the law, greater than anything and everything you could ever imagine, then let us approach the throne of God with confidence. And not just a tabernacle in the wilderness, but the throne of God in heaven where angels and other beings that you cannot fathom again dwell and give praise and glory to God. And you can approach that because of Jesus Christ's finished sacrifice on the cross because He was our high priest, is our high priest, and He laid down His life for us and He said, It is finished. I've come and done the work that you've called me to do. Hebrews chapter 5. Every high priest is selected. It's not something that you do on your own. You have to be selected for it. From among the people, Jesus Christ had to become a human being and is appointed to represent the people in matters relating to God to offer gifts and sacrifices. So you know what the difference there? A gift offering was a gift offering. It was a gift because you thanked God. And a sin offering was the sacrifice which the blood was a representation of atonement for your sins. But you know that the blood of bulls and goats can never atone for your sins. Okay? <clears throat> he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, not even realizing that you are sinning, since he himself is subject to the same weaknesses, fully human. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. But Jesus is different. Jesus did not sin. Though tempted in every way, he did not sin. Therefore, he could become the sacrifice. Again, think about that. I can't imagine being the high priest and going in and carrying this burden for myself and for others. But now Jesus also does that and lays down his own life. And he's not an animal. He knows that he's laying down his life. An animal doesn't know to come off that altar. As the, as the author says in um, Romans, Paul says, he says, Therefore I appeal to you to be a liver, living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. But I don't know about you, but the problem I have with that is I don't like staying on the altar. <laughs> I want to get off of it. I don't like suffering I don't like the pain. I like doing what I want to do, and I certainly want to come off of that altar. But Jesus willingly laid down His life as the ultimate sacrifice. <clears throat> Verse 4, And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. Now you know who Aaron was, right? Okay? And you know the, the things in the Old Testament about the Ark of the Covenant and the, the, the rituals and um, the dress of the high priest and all these things. You know a little bit about it. But the Hebrews were a lot more familiar with it. Okay, And a lot of these laws had become so much traditions that they worshipped traditions and worshipped the law just as they, much as they worshipped God, unfortunately. And we do some of the same things. Homework. Exodus chapter 25 to 29. Homework. Exodus chapter 25 to 29. Read it again. Read the things that the, the high priest had to do. Read the design of the tabernacle. Look at the intricacy that went into it. Look at how God gave people talent to do this. Look at the jewels and the abundance that went into the producing all these things. And then remember that this is just a copy of of God's throne room in heaven. It cannot even compare. And I've got some little guides that will help you. i got enough for each and every family, and if I need to get more, I will. This will help explain a little bit more to you. Look at the detail. Look at the, the difference in the rooms. See where I get to. I'm trying to make sure I'm going to be close. Fred, you got to share with your parents. Okay, we're pretty close. There's so much detail, and we don't understand again, and we get caught up with real, that they really need to do all this. Look at this amazing detail. Look at the things that went into it and everything. Yes, 
God demanded this, period. And this is only a copy. And God demands His people to be holy without sin. Even the sin that you did not know that you committed. That's why there was a scapegoat that went out into the wilderness. All of these things, God is holy. And we are unholy. And the thing that makes us holy, period, is faith in who Jesus Christ is and what He has done. Could there be a more perfect plan? <laughs> do you believe this? And do you live it as a result? In Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, or Abihu, however you want to pronounce it, I've heard it different ways, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense, and they offered unauthorized or strange fire before the Lord. This is Aaron's sons. <clears throat> Contrary to his command, so fire came out of the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Aaron couldn't even mourn. This is serious business. In Numbers 20, verses 6 through 12, Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance to the, of, to the tent of meeting and fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, Take your staff, you and your brother Aaron, gather the assembly together. Speak to that, speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so there so them and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assemblies together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring, your water, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out in the community, and their livestock drank. What an insignificant little thing. Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to it. No, it's not insignificant because God told him to speak to the rock. He's not God. He can't change God's commandments. God said, do this. And that's what we're commanded to do. Verse 12, But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me, Moses and Aaron, because you didn't trust enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community in the land I've given them. And Moses did not lead the people into the promised land. Being God's children is serious business. Now... <laughs> They offered sacrifices with the blood of bulls and goats. You're God's children through the sacrifice and shed blood of Jesus Christ. Wow. Being God's children is serious business. Oh, wait a minute. The verses we read said we were also a kingdom and priests. We belong to the kingdom of heaven. We have God living and dwelling in us, not in a tabernacle. And we are priests that can enter the throne room of God in heaven. Do you not think this is serious business to live as a Christian, live as Christ in this world? To let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven? To be obedient to Jesus' word? Because He even said that you won't follow the voice of another. That you'll be obedient to Him if in fact you're His children. Being God's priest is serious, and we are a kingdom of priests. As you're doing your homework, look at that handout and everything, because it will help explain, because you have a visual picture of what you're reading. It'll make such a difference. It's the author's illustration. It may not be exactly as, as you see it, but it will be a huge help to put something to cite what you're reading here, which we cannot even fathom. Hebrews chapter... 5, verse 5. In the same way, Christ did not take on Himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to Him, You are My Son, today I have become Your Father. He's quoting from Psalms 2, 7. And we saw last week where we saw a continual pattern of quoting from Psalm, and we read the one Psalm, Psalm 95, that was quoted from the most. If you think back to that, Psalms 2, 7 was how the author in Hebrews started the letter in chapter 1. That was his first quote from the Old Testament. You are my son, today I have become your father. 
And he says in another place, you are priests forever in the order of Melchizedek, quoting from Psalm 110, verse 4. So Psalms 2, 7 quotes that Jesus is a prince. Jesus is a king. And Psalms 110, 4, which we have back to back here in uh, Hebrews chapter 5, says that Jesus is a priest. Jesus is our king. Jesus is our priest. Period. Backed up from Scripture in the Old Testament. But now we've got this, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Right, Rose? Who's Melchizedek? Come on. But let's not lose focus. That's not the purpose of the letter. Who is Jesus? Don't lose focus of the letter. I'll tell you who he is today, Rose, without a doubt, though. You can read all the commentaries you want. Throw them out the window. I'm going to tell you who he is in a minute. We're not there yet. 1 Samuel 13, verses 8 through 14. He, that's King Saul, waited seven days from the time set by Samuel, the priest. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began, began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offering. Sounds reasonable to me. I'm king. I should be able to do it, right? And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? Samuel asked. Saul replied, When I saw the men were scattered and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembled against us, I thought, there's your first mistake, I thought, God says, love even your enemy, right? Don't think how you can justify not doing it. God said, okay? But, but King Saul said, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. It's reasonable. I'm king, and I want to do this right, and I've got authority to offer sacrifices, don't I? So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Verse 13, you have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the commandment the Lord, the God, gave you. If you had... He would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. Now Saul's our first king that we see, correct? And in, in, in mankind's eyes, he's the image of the king. He stood a, foot, a whole head taller than everybody else. He was a man's man, but he wasn't God's man because he was too full of himself, was he not? And he disobeyed God. <clears throat> Verse 14, But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. Scripture tells us that when we believe in Jesus Christ, when we put our faith and trust in Him, that God will write His laws on our heart. Are you living by your heart that Jesus has filled? <clears throat> he has appointed Him as ruler of, of His people because you have not kept the Lord's commandment. So now we're back to, to Hebrews, and we're like, who's this Melchizedek? I've got to figure this out. <laughs> and we spend so much time trying to figure out who Melchizedek is instead of who is Jesus Christ to us. Is he not greater than the law? Is he not greater than Moses? Is he not greater than anything and everything? Is he not greatest to you, and is he not becoming, like I said last week, greater and greater, bigger and bigger, as you're getting closer to the hope that you profess? Because as you're maturing and not staying in that childlike faith, you should be seeing Jesus as bigger and bigger and bigger. If you're familiar with C.S. Lewis's works and the, and the Narnia works and stuff, one time Lucy sees Aslan, which is a representation of Jesus, and she says, you're bigger. And he says, no, my child, you've grown because you see me bigger. Jesus is bigger than anything and everything that you can imagine. Is he that big to you? Verse 7 of Hebrews 5. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions, just like a priest is supposed to, with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. Don't get sidetracked here. He was a man. He knew that God could save him from death. But he said, not my will, but your will. Remember? 
Of course he's going to cry out. He doesn't want to go through this pain and suffering, but he wants God's will. I'm going to cry out. I can't live my life as a living sacrifice. But yes, I can because God lives through me and I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And he was heard because of his reverent submission to God. Even Jesus submitted. Verse 8, Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. So why should you complain about what you suffer for Christ? And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Now this is not saying that you've got to have works to be saved. This is saying again, just like James is going to say, if you are saved, you will have works. How can you not if you're truly saved? Verse 10, And he was designated by God to become a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Oh, we got that verse again. Quote it again. Uh, a priest did priestly duties. Jesus is our high priest that once and for all offered himself up because he was sinless. He could offer the one sacrifice that no other priest could do and for once and for all pay your sin debt so that you could approach God. When he did that, what happened? The, the veil to the Holy of Holies, and you can get an idea of how big that curtain is from that and from reading the scriptures, tore in two. It would take two monster trucks to both sides, tearing, ripping both directions to rip that curtain, and I don't know if they still would. They'd probably just sit there and spin. This was a massive curtain, and it ripped because Jesus Christ sacrificed his life to pay your sin debt so that you could approach God. A priest, high priest, who did his ultimate duty by sacrificing himself because he was fully human, he was without sin. Now, I told you to think about that before. Think about, especially as you're approaching Easter, what Jesus Christ has done for you. The anguish, the turmoil that he had to be going through. And when he's on the cross, knowing feeling in his soul, presence, however it was that God was going to pour out his wrath on him, but also abandon him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because every one of our sins, every sin of every person that's ever been done, committed willingly or committed in stupidity, was laid upon Jesus' shoulder, and he took that so that he could take it away from you, the judgment because we all are going to come forth before the judgment seat of Christ. But if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, then you're going to heal not guilty, my son, my daughter. Wow, what a great salvation. Verse 11, We have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear for, to you because you no longer try to understand. Well, wait a minute. He's writing this to the Hebrews and they think they understand. They think they know the law. Think back to the Pharisees and everything. I guarantee you, if you sat down in that church that day, you could ask this person who Melchizedek was, and they'd tell you, this person who Melchizedek was, and they'd tell you, and this person, but would they all be the same thing, and do they matter? It matters who Jesus is. Who was George Washington? He was yeah, he was a president. That's a fact, isn't it? First president, even. Did he cut down that cherry tree? Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. Does it matter? Was he a Christian? Mm. Mm. He, didn't a church, he didn't attend church uh, regularly. He did a lot of other things that would be contradictory to that. Was he? I don't know. What do we know? He was the first president. Okay, now with that in mind, we're going to look at who Melchizedek is, was. Okay? All right, and what the author is saying here, he's not, he's not basing who Melchizedek is on all the things we think. He's basing Melchizedek on who he was. Melchizedek is the only one in the Bible besides Jesus Christ who was both a king and a priest, period. We have laws against that later. Melchizedek was before that. So if you take that in there, yes, he's a comparison to Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is our true high priest and offers up himself as sacrifice. Okay, let's go digging on. 
Uh, and we have much to say about this, but it's hard because you no longer try to understand. You get caught up in these other things. Hmm. Okay. Verse 12. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers. Hmm. You need someone to teach you instead the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with teachings about righteousness. Righteousness. Let's see. I can chase all these things about Melchizedek and try to figure this out. Or I can read the scriptures because I know God desires a holy people. And he's even called me a priest now. So I need to study even more so that I can live a holy life that glorifies him because I'm representing others. And I should be having prayers and petitions for them. So I need to study it even more because of the obligation and duty that God has given me. And I can't do it on my own, but the Spirit will do it through me. He'll even reveal as I read God's Word, which we already read in Hebrews 4.12, as I read God's Word and it sanctifies me through and through and teaches me everything about Jesus, not Melchizedek, by the way. Am I reading and studying God's Word? Do I understand the position that He's given me? Do I realize who I am in Christ? Or am I turning back to other teachings instead of to live a holy, righteous life? Do you know at six months of age, infants, whatever you want to say, they can start eating meat? You have to ground it up for them. You have to make it a puree, whatever you have to do, and you have to feed it to them yourself. But they're already, their body is already craving something more than just milk. Their body is craving it, and they don't even know it. What about you, Christian? Are you craving meat? Or are you stuck on these milk things? Hmm. Verse 14, But solid food is for the mature, who by a constant who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Okay, Awana people. We know who, what Hebrews 4.12 was, right? We can remember that just from last week. Right? Got it? 2 Timothy 2.15. Go ahead, Bob. Do it all. What was the rest after shame? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, who rightly divides the word of truth. I might have missed one part, but I don't think I did. There's so many, like I said, I get so many different versions or translations. Study to show thyself approved. Study, not just read, but study. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman, I've got a position that is not ashamed now and forevermore, especially on Judgment Day, because I rightly handle this word of truth. So I can realize when I get on a topic like Melchizedek that that's one of the most misquoted topics in the Bible, and people are divided on it. Oh, let's, let's get into something like tongues or something else, and let's really get divided. Oh, let's get divided on the color of the carpet, guys. Come on. Let's get concentrating on living righteous, holy lives as a priest and a kingdom. How about 2 Timothy 3.16? All Scripture is inspired. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, like we just have right here. I don't know what your translation has exact words, but doctrine, knowing about God, reproof. What's that word mean? <laughs> King James. That means convicting you of your sin, your wrongdoings, because this is God's law. I'm not doing it right, so I have a correction. I've got to be corrected so that I can be trained back in God's ways and be righteous because it's what I was designed to do from the beginning of creation and I was bought with Jesus Christ's blood to put me back to that place. So I'm in a right standing with God, living to glorify and praise Him, to give thanks to Him and draw other people to God. 
I need to be studying God's Word so I'm that kind of approved workman. And I know that the Word of God is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting even to the soul and spirit. It's okay, I don't need to know what all that is. The bones and the marrow. What's the rest of it? Rightly dividing the word of truth so I understand what is truth and what's not so that I don't get caught on some false doctrine, even if it's not false. George Washington may have cut down that cherry tree. Melchizedek may be an angel. He may be a, a premonition of Jesus Christ in the flesh. He may be an immaculate conception. I'm rolling my eyes more on that one. He may be Noah's son, Shem. These are all things that you will read about Methuselah. I mean, Melchizedek. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> wrong, wrong mail there. The, all those things. Did it matter that George Washington cut, cut down a cherry tree? Does it matter who Melchizedek is? Okay, Rose. Here is who Melchizedek is. The only person in history that was a king and a priest. That's all you need to know. Period. And Jesus Christ is like him because he is our priest and king and so much more. That's what's important from the scripture there. So then we transition into Hebrews chapter 6. Because we've learned that we need solid food so that we can train ourselves so that we can distinguish good from evil. Therefore, okay, let's tie this together. Let us move beyond elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. At six months of age, a baby's already craving food more than milk. What are you craving? Okay? Don't you want to grow up spiritually? Uh, you did physically, especially when you reach a certain point where you had the mentality to think that. So if you have the mentality of who Jesus Christ is and He's greater than everything, don't you want to grow up and mature and be more like Christ? All right, how old are you going to be when you're in heaven? That's a good topic. I'm going to be age 32 and have the perfect body and everything because I want to be fit. I don't want to be 65 in heaven. Things hurt. <laughs> right? Okay, what if your what if your new tent body then in heaven was based off your physical maturity? I mean, spiritual maturity. I'll get it right here in a minute. How many little babies in heaven do you think we'd see? Don't you want to grow up spiritually? Okay. So saying that, therefore let us move beyond elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from the acts that lead to death and of faith in God. We've got to have repentance so that we have faith in God brings that. Instructing about cleansing rites, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgments, which is still a hot topic for the church, and God permitting, we will do so. Four. Yours may not have four in verse four. Four, prepositional phrase tying it together. It is impossible for those who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance, to lose to, to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. Oh my goodness, we've got into another one of those verses. That divides instead of uniting us. Can I lose my salvation? Uh, what's going on here? Uh, let's break it down to childlike faith. For, it ties it together. For what? It is impossible. Impossible for what? Those who have been enlightened, whoever they are. Oh, well, it tells me a little bit more. Tasted the heavenly gift. Shared in the Holy Spirit. Sounds like saved to me. Tasted, though. Mm, tasted, I only sampled something. I didn't really eat it. Wait a minute, let's see how the author of Hebrews used it. He used it one other time previously when he said that Jesus Christ tasted death. What does that verse say, though? It says that he tasted death, Hebrews 2, 9. Jesus suffered death so that he might taste death for everyone. He fully died. That's the verse we go to. Go to verse 10. You're in Hebrews, turn to it. Hebrews 2, verse 10. He tasted that death. He fully died. Taste implies I ate it. 
Even if it's just a little sample, I ate it. I should digest it. It went into me. It, it was food. I ate it, whether it's taste or not. Verse 10, Jesus suffered death so that he might taste, for every, taste death for everyone, so he fully died, so that, verse 10, bringing many sons and daughters to glory. Oh, we forget to quote that verse. The reason that he suffered death was to bring people to glory, to God. So if we take that same thing back here, it's impossible for those who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God, we've got the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance, where he just said was a basic foundation for belief. Sounds kind of like what Jesus is talking about with the so seed that he's sowing into the soils that some of it springs up, but the weeds come in and take over. Or the ones that spring up, but they have no root, and later the sun scorches them. Were they saved? Hmm. We can debate that all you want to. Or we can go over this trail over here that says, again, with childlike faith, the farmer planted his seed to produce a crop. That's the only one that's valuable to the farmer. That's why he did it. He wouldn't have wasted his seed on the other. But God is so extravagant, He sows His seed everywhere that men will come to Him, period. And if you have come to Him, then you will be going past elementary teachings. You will be growing and maturing. Because whatever it means, if you've been tasted of that and fall away, whatever that means, you, it's impossible for you to be enlightened again. Wow, what a warning. But the author goes on to say, I don't think this is you because I do think that you've believed. But he's already said, you're like babies. You need to grow up. Hear this message. Jesus is greater than all these things. Grow in Him. Let Him become the greatest to you. Keep moving through whatever is, is, is entangling you in your lives and what you're suffering through and everything else. Fixing your eyes on Jesus. And He's going to use all these examples from the Old Testament of their faith who never knew that Jesus would die for them and lay down his own life. <clears throat> Verse 7. Land drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop. Told you it sounded like the seed parable of the sower and the seed. It produces a crop, what? That is useful to those for whom it is farmed. Your life was brought back. You were brought to glory. That's why Jesus tasted death, so you could bring many more sons and daughters into glory. Are you living like Jesus? You are the priests that are left here on earth now. You are the kingdom of heaven who is here on earth. Jesus said, I must depart, but it's better for me to depart so that the Holy Spirit can come and live in you so that you can be my ambassadors. Paul says that, but you understand what I'm saying. You can be my representative here on earth. And if you love me, you will obey me. My sheep listen to my voice. So if you're not doing that, we need to step back and look at how mature we are or if we even have any birth at all. And another thing about infants that don't grow, they usually die prematurely also, don't they? Verse 7, land that drinks rain in the rain, often, fall, often falling on it, and then produces a crop useful for those for whom it is farmed, receive the blessing of God. But, there's your opposite. Land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless. It is in danger of being cursed, and it will be burned. Do you get the point? You can go off on all kind of religious theology that you want to, but the point is, if the seed was planted, it should be growing. If you've been enlightened and you've tasted the Spirit and the Word of God, then you should be growing in maturity, becoming like Christ. And if you aren't, wake up. Even though we speak like this, verse 9, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation, because you've gone past repentance, and now you're in the salvation part, the saving grace of God. Verse 10, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work <clears throat> and the love you have shown Him as you help His people and continue to help them in the things that you do. 
We want each of you to show this diligence to the very end, to stay anchored, to not go adrift like we talked about last week, so that what you hope for may be fully realized, that you finally reach that distant shore, whatever exactly that looks like. Verse 12, we do not want you to become lazy. Now we've even got that in there. Laziness. We don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and, pati and patience inherit what has been promised. Think about James again as you read it. When God made his promise to Abraham, okay, think of how long Abraham had to be patient. Think of the things that he had to go through. Think of the fact, the fact that he was even asked to sacrifice his only son that finally came. What? Okay. <clears throat> when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself saying, I will surely bless you and will give you many descendants. And so, after, and so after waiting patiently, Abraham did receive what is promised. That's a fact. We know that it's a fact. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and an oath confirms this. So people can swear, but an oath makes it even stronger. Um, and the oath confirms what is said and puts, it, puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of His purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath, not just a promise, but an oath. Verse 18, God did this so that two unchangeable did this so that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we have fled to take hold of the hope set before us and may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor, relating back to that coming to a drift or not coming to a drift, as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure, because Jesus is our high priest. He is our sacrifice. He has done it once and for all. It is finished. <clears throat> it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Did Melchizedek cut down a cherry tree? Don't know. Was Melchizedek an angel? Probably not. Was Melchizedek Jesus Christ? Probably not. Now, we're going to get into some verses that are going to confuse you, so let's keep reading. Okay? And I said probably not. Don't pin me to the wall if you think that. Okay, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. This Melchizedek was, there you go, king of Salem and priest of the Most High God. He met Abram, Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. The author of Hebrews says Abraham. If you read your scriptures, it's Abram at this point. But he knows Abr Abram becomes Abraham because he has faith in the promises that God's going to give him. So we've got Abraham, we see a future. Read Genesis 14 and 15 so that you study more. Melchizedek is only mentioned there in Genesis 14 and in Psalms. Genesis 14 tells us the story. There's a battle between kings of the earth. We fight battles of kings and kingdoms physically. There's a king of Babylon there. There's a king of Sodom and Gomorrah there. We constantly fight battles of who our allegiance is going to be pledged to. A king of this world or the king of kings, which is Jesus Christ. Who are you going to serve? These kings come in and beat these other kings. Then Abram, Abram finds out that Lot's been taken. He takes 318 men and go fights these kings that already beat these other kings? 318 men? Come on. But he is victorious and he brings Lot back. And along the way he is met by Melchizedek, a king of Salem. We saw this here. And a priest of the Most High God. And he's also met by the king of Sodom. And the king of Sodom says, give me back my men, but keep your riches. And Abraham says, no, I'm not keeping the riches, because then you'll say that the world made me rich. God is who's going to make me rich and going to give me his blessing. He's already told me so. And Melchizedek comes out and offers bread and wine, and he blesses Abram. Now, here's the thing. The king of Sodom, because he's right there in that story, recognizes Melchizedek as a real person, a real king, a real priest. Abraham recognizes him. We don't go into what he was or anything else. And that king priest, who was both, blesses Abram. And Abraham, or Abram receives that blessing. 
he recognizes that, that Melchizedek is greater than him. He recognizes his position as king and as priest of the Most High God. Okay, now let's go back to Hebrews 7 and try to run through it real quick. Try. What time is it? Okay, if you don't care, I don't care for sure. Okay. Verse 2. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means, now we've got a definition, king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Probably Salem would later become known as Jerusalem. Okay? All right. Verse 3, without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life. There's where we want to get sidetracked again and all these other things. Without father or mother. Read the book of Genesis. It's a book of lineage, history. This person begat this person, begat this person, begat this person, and they all end in death. Death is what is the one thing you can all count on here. Taxes, probably. Death. Yes, they all died. We have no record of Melchizedek's birth. We have no genealogy of him, of sons who would take his priesthood. We have no record of his death. So it depends on whether you want to get all sidetracked or just take what the author is presenting here and say, Melchizedek, you all know this, has no record of these things. Okay? He resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever since we don't have a record of his death, since it wasn't passed on to another descendant. Okay? Verse 4, just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of, the, of his plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi, this comes later, because we were way before the, for Moses and the law, now the law requires the descendants of Levi who became priests to collect a tenth from the people, that is from their fellow Israelites, even though they, all, they, all, they also are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace it, his descent from Levi. Okay? Yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser is being blessed by the greater. In one case... In, in the one case, the tenth is collected by the people who die, but in the other case, by whom is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, where the Levites come from, who collect the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham. Because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the, in the body of his ancestor, tying all these children together. If perfection, it's a key word, which means a little differently than some of the other words that are translated the same way. It means fully accomplished, bringing to completion, not just bringing to completion, but specifically bringing to completion men to God. If that could be done, if that could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood and indeed the law given to a people established the priesthood, then think this, think why was there still need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, Jesus. Not in the order of Aaron. It cannot come through Levi. It comes through the tribe of Judah. Behold the Lamb of Judah. <laughs> Behold the Lion of Judah. Verse 13, He of whom these things are said belongs to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever sacrificed at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. So Moses didn't even know about it. He gave the law and everything. Jesus is so much greater than Moses. And what we, what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears. Now, do you tie it all together? Who is he? He was a king and a priest. <laughs> there you go. Verse 16, one who has become a priest, not on the basis of regulation of his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. Now it all comes forward to Jesus Christ, who raised from the dead. Who ever heard? We saw miracles before, even in the Old Testament, of other people being raised. 
but no one ever raising themselves, but Jesus did. Verse 17, For it is declared you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. There it is again. Psalm 110 verse 4. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect. So if you're relying on your works of righteousness, mm-mm. And a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Verse 20, <clears throat> And it was <clears throat> not without oath. Others became priests without an oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said, Psalm 110, verse 4 again. The Lord has swore and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Do you get it? So now the people there, just like we read Psalm 95 before, would have been very familiar with Psalm 110. Are you? No. I'm not either, without doing the research first. Here's what Psalm 110 says. And you've heard these quoted throughout the New Testament. Matter of fact, if you get to thinking, I can think of all these times it was quoted or implied to. And you'll see that it's the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's how it starts. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your, on your day of battle. Any, Arrayed in holy splendor, your young men will come to you like dew from the morning's womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush the kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook along the way, and so he will lift his head high. All about Jesus. Now, till Jesus came, who would have the priests... And Levites and Pharisees said this psalm was about the Levites. They wouldn't have said it was about Jesus because we didn't have the recognition of that. We don't even know that it's authored by David, but Jesus says it is. In Mark 12, verse 35, you should recognize that Jesus quoted it, this psalm. He said, Why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How can, then can he be his son? Melchizedek was a king and a priest. Priest and a king. Jesus is king, not from David's lineage, even though it can be traced back. He is the king of God. He is his son, his Prince, he will reign, as this psalm says. David recognizes it prophetically. He is a priest in the order of Melchizedek, who we have no record of lineage of him dying or anything, but was recognized as a priest. All that you're going to read about in your homework and study about and look at the, the drawings and everything points you to the throne room in heaven, where guess what's going on right now? Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, pleading that you belong to Him, if in fact you do. Finishing out Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22, Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now there have been many, uh, many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, He has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, He is able to save us completely. Wow. Those who come to God through Him because He always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need. That's what He's still doing. Is He's still doing His priestly, kingly duties in heaven for you and I. Ugh. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one is who, who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priest men in their weakness, but the, but the oath which came after the law, appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. Do you see how Jesus is greater? We're back to the same place we were last week. Is Jesus 
becoming greater and greater and greater for you. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your word. Lord, may we grow up to be mature, to be like Christ. May we realize our priestly duties. May we realize what it belong, means to belong to the kingdom of heaven. May we realize what it means for you to dwell with us. May we realize what Jesus Christ did for us when he suffered and died and completed your work. The atoning sacrifice that saves any that will come to Jesus Christ simply by faith. There is nothing that we can do, O oh Lord. It's impossible for mankind to reach heaven, to have eternal salvation. But all things are possible to you, O oh God, and we praise your glorious name for that. And we thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.